Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. And today I am joined by the delightful Zach Kramer, who is joining us from Portland in Oregon. And Zach is a certified EOS implementer who uses the they, them pronouns. Hey, welcome to the show, Zach. Awesome to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to it. Absolute pleasure. Um, so you are a certified EOS implementer, but that hasn't always been your gig, has it? So tell us a little bit about, about your journey through life to get to where you are now. Yeah, well, I mean, do you want me to start with my my history as a petty thief? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so, um, so my very first business, it did not go well. Uh, so what I did is I went into the garage and I took a bunch of my dad's tools and I put them into my little red wagon. Um, and I started going door to door in my neighborhood in Los Angeles uh, and selling my dad's tools to my neighbors for pennies on the dollar. And I was eight years old, but that is not an excuse for criminal behavior. Um, and so my mom was wondering where I was. And I think five or 10 minutes later, she came and found me down the street and dragged me home. And that was the end of my very first business. I think it lasted like an hour, maybe. <laughs> and like the cost of goods sold was terrible. The revenue was not there. I mean, really not an auspicious start to my entrepreneurial journey. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> that, sorry, that's got me in stitches. I'm trying really hard not to laugh too like hiding the microphone. That is absolutely brilliant. Um, Tell me, did dad get his tools back? Uh, no, he didn't. Well, he got back the ones that were still in the wagon, but I mean, right. we, we <laughs> weren't going to go back. To the I mean, that would have been rude. You know, they got a steal of a deal on a hammer. What? They have that, you know, what are you going to do? Say, oh, my idiot kid didn't know what the markup was supposed to be. I'm sorry. Uh, no. Yeah, okay, perfect. So that was the start of your entrepreneur career. Um, I'm guessing you learned a few lessons from that. Where did you go to next? <laughs> uh, I swear to God, uh, the next thing I did was I sold candy on the playground and um, uh, in middle school and high school. Uh, I was a candy mm -hmm. dealer. Um, yeah. And I mean, literally candy made out of sugar. I was not selling marijuana or something else that you know you would call candy. It was literal actual candy. Did it at summer camp too. Um, and then when I went to college, I was a ticket scalper. Um, so I would, I got, uh, I was early in the game of getting, you know, five or 10 different credit cards, a bunch of different addresses. I'd use different people's dorm rooms, right? So that they, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't know who's, uh, you know, that I was doing that. And I would buy a bunch of Boston Red Sox tickets and then I would uh, go and scalp them. So I had a lot of fun with that. And then when I graduated college, um, uh, do you guys have, Best Buy in New Zealand. Is that a store you have? No, I don't think so, but I have heard of it. It's a, so it's a huge store that sells computers, TVs, um, you know, it does, they have this thing called Geek Squad that does the repairs. Anyways, despite the fact that there was this megalithic multinational, um, you know, multi-billion dollar company out there, I said, you know what the world really needs is a store that sells computers. Like, that's what I should do because I'm a nerd, right? And so I opened a, um, a computer sales uh, and repair store. Uh, it was called Happy Hamster Computer Repair um, because, you know what? Fun, right? Let's have some fun. Uh, built that into a chain of, of three stores, realized that dealing with the end customer sucks. They don't have very much money and they like to complain a lot. Um, so I sold those stores, made about a million bucks. And then I started IT Assurance, which was an IT services company for businesses, built that, sold it. Uh, somewhere along the way, realized that if all your assets walk out the door at the end of the day, which they do in professional services, you really don't have a net worth. So started turning the money I got out of the IT services into real estate. And now I own uh, several buildings here around town um, that have been my sort of lifeblood. Um, Coming out of that last business, the IT services business, was looking around for what to do next. And I thought, well, you know, this EOS thing that I've been doing, right? It's how I run my companies. This is real fun. I wonder if I could, you know, I wonder if I could do this, right? And so uh, had a friend ask me for some help, help them out. Had another friend ask me for some help, help them out. And uh, I sort of started to call myself the accidental EOS implementer. I was just, <laughs> just kind of doing it. And so that was the, that was the beginning of the beginning of the end, the beginning of this current phase of, of doing EOS. Fantastic. And so um, in terms of what you're most proud of throughout that journey, have you got something that you kind of really um, are proud of and professional personally? Absolutely. I mean, I would say the thing that I'm the most proud of is that I started my journey very much trying to be something, right? Trying to be the image of a masculine, white, male, business owner, person, you know, the way that I thought I was supposed to be as a business owner. Mm -hmm. And as I went through my business journey and discovered that it was okay to be a, you know, queer, non-binary, autistic person and running a business, 
that that was okay and that I could do that. And I didn't have to adhere to some image that I had seen in books written in the 1960s about what an executive was supposed to look like. And I could still be successful and make enormous amounts of money, despite being also a, you know, liberal business owner who runs his business according to loving best practices, instead of just sort of looking at the bottom line and saying, nobody cries here. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Okay. I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite sure where to go with that from now. now but that, So tell me a little bit about, so I, I picked up on the autism thing and I hadn't actually picked this up when we talked. So I, yeah. is that a diagnosed thing? Are you actually kind of yeah. on the, the, yeah, okay. And and yeah, so that, because we talked about being a high fact finder. Now that makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, definitely part and parcel. Um, yeah. Well, so uh, it used to be called Asperger's syndrome. Um, so okay. we now call it high functioning autism. Um, we don't yeah. call it Asperger's anymore because it turns out that Dos Dr. Asperger was a Nazi who participated in the genocide of children. So we're just okay. way off that we're, we're, term. We're not going there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's HFA now, high functioning autism. Um, yeah. And yeah, I was diagnosed with it, I don't know, probably 10 years ago. Um, and it's yeah. just, you know, part of my personality, part of who I am. You know, autism is just a descriptor of characteristics, right? Yeah. So it's not a disease. I don't have like a problem that needs to be fixed. It's simply a description mm. of some of the characteristics of my personality. So I'm, I'm wondering, though, because, of course, my mind immediately goes to kind of EOS and kind of going, okay, so in terms of the kind of visionary integrator scale, uh, which is more natural for you? Because you've talked about building businesses, you know, one after the other. And yet at the same time, a high fact finder generally tends to be more of an, an integrator type person. So I'm just curious as to what that means. So interestingly on this one, I am a high fact finder, low follow through. So ah. I really like details. I really like digging into the weeds. I really like learning everything I can learn about something. But I yeah. don't like following a process. I don't like building a process. I just want the information. You know, there, there are times, um, so I, I took a vacation to Mexico a couple of months ago. And one of yeah. the things I noticed in Mexico is that they tell you don't drink the water, drink only the bottled water, right? And I was just sort of wondering, well, that's curious. Why is that? Why? And so I think I spent, I don't know, four or six hours going down a rabbit hole of learning about the Mexican drinking water infrastructure. Because I'm just curious, like, why is it like this? Why don't they have clean drinking water? That's an yeah. A-fact finder, right? Somebody tells me the, the water here isn't good. And I go, that's interesting. Let me go find out about that. I didn't do anything about it. I didn't then try to fix it. I didn't, you know, just yeah. kind of like, oh, now I know. Yeah, okay. But I suppose that that is part of the visionary, isn't it? It's always looking at the different, you know, what trying to find solutions for things is actually what visionaries do. So that makes perfect sense. Okay, so I'm curious, EOS, I, I get that it was a natural progression for you to kind of go from doing it accidentally to, to do it, taking it on board as a profession. But how did you first come across EOS? Because here in little old New Zealand, it's not a well-known kind of um, terminology. It's not a well-known framework. Whereas in the US, obviously, it's a lot more um, prolif prolific, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But so it, it happened after a shitty staff meeting. So we had a staff meeting and mm -hmm. it went really badly. My, my people were unhappy. It took a long time. We didn't really get through much of the agenda. And I'd been running a business for like eight or nine years at that point. And I was like, this is stupid. How have I been running a business this long? And I can't just have an effective meeting. And so I literally just went to my computer and just Googled like, how do you have a good meeting? And an EOS microsite popped up for the level 10 meeting, which is obviously, you know, one of the most important tools in EOS. And it was just this light bulb moment of like, oh, I can stop trying to figure this out and make it up on my own. There's a system out there for it already, right? Like the, the, I can just implement this system instead of trying to figure out how do I set goals? How do I hold people accountable? How do I decide on the right people? Because figuring all that out from scratch like is hard. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's probably part of the reason why I fell in love with it too. So I'd been coaching and running businesses for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, but I, and, you know, people kind of go, oh, EOS, but it's just a cookie cutter. It's kind of forces you into something. It doesn't, it just means that all the basic stuff that you need to do in a business is put into a beautifully simple, not easy, but simple system that you can actually use. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's what I always say to people is people, you know, people are like trying to think of new business ideas. Like, oh, should I run my new business on EOS? I'm like, absolutely not. EOS is for you have a business, you have clients, you have customers, something's already there. This yeah. is infrastructure, right? Yeah. It's not startup methodology. It's not how do you get this thing off the ground? It's how do you run the thing you're already doing? Yes, yeah. Actually, that's a really good point. And of course, Gino um, has now developed the whole suite of products, hasn't he? So you've got the EOS, yeah. which is definitely for the, the established businesses, and you've got the Entrepreneurial Leap, which is more for the startups, and then um, some of the more um, internal self-analysis stuff that is for once you've kind of reached a certain point um, on the, oh gosh, I'm trying to think, of, um, I've lost my words right now. Uh, but you know, the, the hierarchy of needs, you know, once you get to that yeah, certain yeah, point, yeah. You're, you're, you're a lot more introspective than you are. Okay, cool. So tell me what EOS did for your businesses then. The biggest thing that EOS did for my businesses was create clarity. When things were going well, we knew why they were going well. And when they were going badly, we knew why they were going badly. They, they, there's so much doubt and uncertainty and unknown in running a business. And once you've got a clear scorecard, clear core values, you know what GWC stands for, you know what the accountability chart is, 
it's just transparency, transparency into why things are the way they are. And it give, gave me the ability to move much more quickly because I was spending a lot less time going, what's wrong? Why is it wrong? Whose fault is it? And a lot more time going, okay, that's what's wrong. I see where the problem is. Like, that's what we need to act on. Let's act. And it, it brings all the team on that journey too, doesn't it? So it's not um, down to the founder to kind of solve all those issues, but it's actually about highlighting them so that the team themselves can actually 10 times their thinking and think about things differently rather than just the business as usual. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it, it was a huge relief. So, um, you know, one of the companies that I implemented in was this IT services company. And what we were amazed at after implementing EOS was that our service employees, the people at the bottom of the scale, the people who are just resetting your password and kind of doing basic stuff, once they were in a level 10 meeting, they actually changed our entire tool set. What we as leaders had thought was the right set of tools to support our customers. They came to us and they were like, hey, we'd rather use this tool. We think it's going to be more efficient. We think it's cheaper. Like people are talking about it on Reddit. Can we use this tool? And we'd be like, yeah, sure. Let's use that tool. And over the course of a couple of years, we actually swapped out our entire tool set and continue to add more tools from a bottom up standpoint where our employees are coming into us as a leadership team and saying, this is what we want to use. Can we try it? And we're going, yeah, great. Yeah, let's use it. And let's see if it improves efficiency and if we like it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. So um, you've already mentioned that the level 10 is, is kind of a game changer. Is that the favorite EOS tool for you in the toolbox? Well, what's your so favorite? Asking someone to name their favorite child or their favorite restaurant. Like, yes, I, yes, I am. <laughs> tool. Yep. Okay. Favorite tool, honestly, mm -hmm. is GWC. Okay. Because well, I find Explain that, that for people yeah. who perhaps haven't come across that concept before. So GWC stands for gets it, wants it, has the capacity to do it. And it's the way that we evaluate if someone is the right fit for the job that they're in. And what I love about GWC is it takes these conversations that used to take days and weeks and months of, is this the right person or not the right person? Why are they working out? Why aren't they working out? There's something wrong with Chuck. What's wrong with Chuck? And it creates a narrow framework that says, does Chuck get it? Does he really understand fundamentally what this job is? Does he want it? Is Chuck excited to be here? Does he want to come to work every day and do amazing things? And does Chuck have the capacity to do it? Does he have the skills, the tools, the resources, the ability to get this job done? And all of a sudden, it took these people problems that we'd spend months hemming and hawing about, and it would make them take minutes, where you just go, oh, you know what? Chuck doesn't want it. Yeah, he does get it. He does have the capacity to do it, but there's no motivation there. He just yeah. doesn't want to do this job. Oh, well, we can't fix that, right? Nothing fixes motivation. I can't give you a pizza party or a raise. If you don't want it, you're not going to want it. Okay, great. Okay. We need to replace Chuck. And that yeah. just, I've seen as I do implementations for other companies, how often that is a light bulb aha moment where people just like, they get it. If they just have yeah. to snap into place. Mm. And of course, the tool that kind of prefaces that is the accountability chart, which is very much making sure that we're thinking about the structure of the business first, rather than the people. So we go actually, what's the structure that's required for the main functions of the business in the leadership team to move forward. Um, and then you apply the GWC tool and you kind of go, okay, well, here we've got some issues. Um, yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little Tell me a little bit about, because um, one of the tools I've been talking a lot about just recently is the whole um, rocket fuel, the whole visionary integrator thing. I think for a lot of people, that's an absolute light bulb moment. Um, tell me your kind of version of visionary integrator and what that does for a business. When you say it's, it's been a light bulb moment for people, you mean understanding that those two functions exist inside of an organization? Yeah, and, and that they don't then, you know, because I, I was talking actually to my yesterday, they were saying that, you know, when they, when they were actually looking to go into a business where they were coming on board as a CEO, there was already an ex existing founder, most recruitment people, they look for a CEO and they actually merge those two roles together and go, we want somebody who's going to be big picture thinking, big relationships, taking us yeah. forward, and yeah. we want you to be absolutely in the minute detail and managing all this stuff. And so he was saying for him, it's like when they suddenly saw the the, the rocket fuel model and kind of and the accountability chart we got a visionary and an integrator it suddenly made sense because they are two quite different people yeah um i'll tell you a story i was uh, working with a team um a couple of months ago and we we're talking about the visionary and the integrator for the first time and the person who would go on to be the visionary uh breaks down crying and he, he puts his head in his hands and he is just bawling and we're all just kind of like what what's going on like what is happening and and he sort of he, he clears his tears up a little bit and he says I always thought there was something wrong with me, right? I thought there was something wrong that I couldn't focus, that I couldn't stay on task, that I couldn't, you know, follow all of these things through. And now I understand. I have a unique skill set. I have a vision, you know? I have this ability and it means this is what I am and this is what I do. And, and there's nothing wrong with me. You know, he'd been so hard on himself, right? About not being the leader he thought his company needed without understanding, like you said, you can't be both. 
you can't have a great vision for your organization and also be the in the weeds day to day person. That's just that the, there aren't people who there are very few people who have both of those skill sets. And so I think that was maybe the most impactful moment for me when it comes to that visionary integrator thing is, is watching as somebody realized they were not a broken person. They had a skill set. They were a visionary. Yeah. Actually, it's really true because I think in my experience, I've been doing not EOS for a long time, but coaching and running business for a long time. I think that um, a lot of the time, yeah, we have this kind of idea of of whom we should be and what's expected of us. And just to have that kind of light bulb. And I think a lot of, I was going to say, a lot of founders that I kind of come across as well, they've often got ADHD or they're sort of, you know, they've got dyslexia or they've got things. And so they assume that there's something wrong with them because yeah. they can't do it. But in actual fact, they suddenly kind of have this realization that, wow, okay, actually, these are my superpowers. I mean, I, I'm yeah. on the ADHD scale and I kind of go, actually, it's a superpower. Um, yeah. I, I, the reason I was actually late for this podcast a wee bit was because I was actually um, at home and I, I switched between one of two things. I'm either completely focused or completely mm -hmm. all over the place. And this yeah. morning I was actually writing a presentation that I'm giving to um, Sydney for EOS worldwide. And mm -hmm. I just got so in the zone that eventually my husband said, are you not meant to be at a podcast at this time? I was like, yeah, <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I think so hopefully people can relate to that. It's like when we, we have these things that we kind of see as being my, my, my husband thinks I'm completely mad and thinks mm. that there's, you know, there's something wrong with me. But it's like, no, actually, they're my superpowers. And that's what makes me a really great visionary in my own business. When it comes yeah. to working in other businesses, a bit like you, I'm guessing I'm really good at being the implementer because I'm not involved in the day to day stuff. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to know what those superpowers are, or not got to, but when you learn what your superpowers are and learn how to stay in those lanes and how to be kind to yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. When there's the downsides of those superpowers, you know, if you're ADHD and you've got that time blindness, right, you have that ability to focus in an incredible way, yeah. but you've got time blindness. You do not notice what time it is, right? Like you get buried in the thing that you're doing. So yeah. be kind, right? Don't beat yourself up because you do that. Love yourself because that's part of your superpower. Yes. Yeah. But it's hard, you know, because you've got the society put certain sort of pressures on you. And I'll, I I can often be here at work and I'll be, you know, I finish the session with the client. I'm doing some stuff outside of that. I love to write. I love to obviously podcast yeah. and whatnot. And I, yeah. I will literally get kind of messages from my husband. It's like, uh, it's 7.30 in the evening. Are you coming home? And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not that I don't want to go home. I just get completely lost in what I'm doing and, and time just flies. Absolutely. And I mean, it's, yeah. you know, we all have to, the person who, uh, has no legs needs a wheelchair right like we need to know what those weaknesses are and how to you know survive in society i mean look as an autistic person i have a very difficult time reading other people's emotional states right i often have a i often struggle to know if somebody's happy or sad or angry or what they're feeling well so i've learned how to deal with that by literally asking right if i'm not sure how somebody's feeling i'll say deborah i want to take a quick pause because i'm not sure i'm picking this up right how are you feeling right now Right. Because I know that's a weakness of mine. So I've got to put something in place to make it a strength, you know, so maybe for you, you've got to like set timers, right, or have, you know, alarms or whatever, you know, what I mean, like, mm -hmm. we find ways if we know what our strengths and weaknesses are, we find ways to make our weaknesses be less weak, and our strengths mm -hmm. be stronger and to, you know, not get divorced. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's my plan. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other the other side of it, of course, is the integrator side. And I think for a lot of visionaries, they struggle with this whole integrator person because that's the, the, almost the polar opposite, isn't it? It's somebody who desperately wants to get down into the uh, the detail and make sure everything is absolutely right and the processes are working and the people are working and, you know, almost becomes, um, they become laser sharp focused, but they almost become a little bit, um, oh, what's the right word? I'm going to say anal, kind of like around focusing mm -hmm. on that planet and not being able to see beyond that. So, um I think sometimes when the visionary understands that that kind of person is a good thing to have, and this is why, that too can change the way that they view things. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, a sometimes we talk about flaming visionaries in the U.S. system, and I, I think of it as kind of an insult, really, right? Which is people need to recognize that they need the other half. I know too many visionaries who have burned out multiple integrators because they think being a visionary means never being limited, right? It means doing whatever you want whenever you want, and they take that flaming visionary thing too far without respecting that, hey, you know, I have a weakness, which is I don't think about the processes and the details. And so I'm so glad you're here to help me think that through, Integrator. I appreciate your skills the same way I ask you to appreciate my skills, because the truth is that both of us have are missing an eye, and it's the two of us together that can see clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. And I think when when it's a good relationship, and obviously there's lots of examples around the world where there have been those visionary integrated relationships, when it is a good relationship, you should have a natural tension, right? You shouldn't, um, you should be quite comfortable with challenging each other uh, from both sides. So the integrator should be quite um, comfortable with challenging the visionary about reining it back in a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But the visionary should be encouraging the integrator to kind of go, hey, hold on a second, let's see if we can broaden the thinking on this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if we think about the um, the accountability chart, the GWC thing, 
just to, can you talk me through how you work with a client to help them develop that accountability chart? Because we talk about the main functions of the business, but I don't know about you. I've certainly had clients where we've taken quite a bit of time to actually get to that, you know, the realization what the real main functions are. So in yeah. your own words, what does a leadership team mean? What does function mean? How do we develop that accountability chart before we start looking for the right people? Yeah. I mean, I use a lot of swearing. Um, I use a lot of, I use a lot of throwing things at them. Um, you know, occasional threats of, of horrific violence against their pets. I mean, whatever it takes to get them to think outside the box. Um, no, actually, my favorite tactic, uh, my favorite tactic when people are really struggling with their accountability chart is I love playing devil's advocate and I love doing it with glee. I mean, I have a lot of fun with it. And so I will say, all right, team, here's what it's going to be, right? And I will draw the most ridiculous accountability chart that I can think of for their company. You know, just yeah. uh, uh, sales is going to report to finance and finance is going to report to operations, and you're going to have a two-person leadership team. Who's with me? Because when you create something for people to fight against, they yeah. start to think about what they actually want, right? Yeah. Like when you, when you draw that, they go, well, sales can never report to finance. Awesome. Who does sales report to? Well, we need sales at the top of the team. Great. So where's sales going to be? They're going to report to the integrator. Okay, like creating the ridiculousness gives them the freedom to start exploring, and it also gives them the straw man to attack. Right. To say, right. no, Zach, your idea is terrible. I know. And here's what we think is actually going to work. And then we start to things sort of start to fall out from there. I really like that. Can I steal that? Oh, yeah. R&D, <laughs> baby. Rip off a yeah, duplicate okay. all day long. <laughs> Perfect. No, I think that's really actually really key because, uh, yeah, um, there is a sort of a, a natural way that a, every company works. I mean, so I've worked, you must have done the same. I work with lots of different companies and yeah. they often kind of say, but you know, our operations team is different because we're an advertising yeah. agency and therefore, yeah. you know, we've got head of strategy, head of creative, head of what I'm kind of, and I kind of go, yeah, but actually the product or service that you deliver is actually the ops part. All those heads of are almost the business as usual stuff that feeds into that. So what's really, really important at this leadership team level, thinking that the leadership team is there to actually push the business forward. It isn't necessarily, you know, obviously being held accountable for business as usual, but pushing the business forward towards that 10-year target. What do we need represented at that level to, to make sure that we do that? Um, and I think that, yeah, it's sort of, it, it's it's always a fun fun game. I think my, what's your longest accountability chart exercise been? You're probably way faster than me. <laughs> oh, longest? I mean, you mean just like in a day, how long it took us to, yeah, I mean, yeah. I've had them take four or six hours before. I've had them take them well into the afternoon, um, yeah. you know, for the bigger, more complicated companies. Um, mm -hmm. But there, it's, I learned this from another EOSI pretty early on, which is, Nothing else works without the accountability chart. You know, the entire rest of the system collapses. And so mm. spend the time. Yeah, and if it, if it means the day is longer, if it means you don't get through as much, it doesn't really matter because if you don't have, if the accountability chart isn't right, how are you going to have GWC? How are you going to yeah. assign uh, uh, scorecard metrics? How are you going to do anything else in the system if you don't have the right accountability chart? So it takes yeah. the time that it takes to, to get it right. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So GWC. So you, I mean, yes, it's a great tool to use when you're originally doing that accountability chart, but it's also used throughout the business in many ways too, isn't it? Give us, yes. some, exa give us some examples of, of how it is used. <laughs> um, you know, obviously when managers are sitting down doing their quarterly reviews, right, internally, and I actually, I'm about to say something that I don't know if it's EOSP or not, it's just something that I advise my clients to do, is yep. once a quarter for each person who has reports to sit down and run the people analyzer on all of their reports. So, you know, check them against the company's core values for each one of the people that reports to them and check them against GWC, because it does change over time. You know, there are situations where someone, you know, their family situation changes, and maybe they wanted it in the past, but now they want to spend more time at home with their kids, and they don't want it, you know, as much yeah. anymore. Or their capacity changes because the industry has changed and they haven't kept up, right? And so they don't actually have the capacity anymore. Or more frequently, the company has grown a lot. And somebody who had the capacity to do it at a $2 million company doesn't have the capacity to do it at a $10 million company. And so uh, I think it's really important that leaders sit down once a quarter and be active in reviewing so that it doesn't sneak up on them and doesn't bite them in the ass, right? When they suddenly realize like, oh, wow, this person's been underperforming for a year and a half, but I didn't notice because they used to be so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's actually, I'm just, I'm making a couple of notes here because that's actually really key and I'm just, it's going to fit my presentation I was working on this morning because uh -huh. you're right. I mean, the, as a company grows, people who are originally right may not be right for the future. And I think even that part about you're not wanting it anymore. The thing I want to just d d d d delve a little bit deeper into though is the whole yeah. capacity thing because um, anybody who kind of reads the books or sees it online, they, they come in with this view that capacity is, you know, it's a time thing, you know, do you have the time to do it? But it's not actually mm -hmm. about time, is it? So I mean, I time is one of the elements, right? Sk uh, yeah. Skills, yeah. tools, time, resources, and ability, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. do they have the skill set to do it? You know, I, look, I admire lawyers. I think lawyers are super cool. I may be in a minority on that, but I think, like, I'm just fascinated by how law works, right? Again, go back to that eight Colby. 
I have never been to law school. I do not have the capacity to be a lawyer, right? I cannot go get a job as a lawyer, have not passed the bar, you know, so you've got to have the skills. Um, tools and resources are the part where I start to then also push back on leadership teams, because sometimes it's just like, this person doesn't have the ability to do this job. You know, you've given them a job and you haven't given them the tools and resources to do it. You know, especially companies that tell me they don't want to spend the money on training. They don't want to spend the money on investing and upgrading in their systems. And I'm like, well, look, if you're not willing to upgrade to the right to, you know, to modern systems to run your business, right, then don't tell me this person doesn't have the capacity, right, because they may not have access to the things they need to succeed in the first place. And you've set them up for failure. And that's on you. Right. So, I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot more to it than just do they literally have enough hours in the day to get the job done. And the way I like to describe it to around time is it's like if you have all of those things, the skills, the knowledge, the expertise, the experience, then you'll be able to do the job in a reasonable time frame. And so that where that's where the time capacity comes in, because if you are a skilled lawyer, you can probably, you know, knock off some legal stuff in, in, a, in a heartbeat. Me and you could probably actually get there in the end, but yeah. uh, <laughs> it'll take us we a whole lot more time. Right for us. Exactly. And it may not be accurate. So we might actually yeah. kind of stuff up on that. So yeah, okay. <laughs> cool. Did you did you see the one about how Chad GPT invented cases for a lot for a case for a uh... I, I've heard a, a little bit about it. I actually saw it live in action. So I, I was very fortunate to go with the Entrepreneurs Organization over to Bali for a conference where they brought in some international speakers about AI. Yeah. So it was ne yeah. next level for us because normally New Zealand and Australia were a little bit behind. And so mm -hmm. this guy literally kind of typed into J chat GPT, you know, how did Colombo find the US when he arrived in 2005? Yeah. And now you and I know that Colombo, Colum yeah, Columbus. Columbus wasn't, yeah. Sorry, not Columbus. Columbus yeah. wasn't around at that time. He was dead, right? But right. ChatGPT is designed to actually fill things in. So it yeah. actually described exactly what he loved about the country and everything else and rah, rah, rah. And then the guy actually typed in, now tell me really what happened. And it said, well, obviously Columbus wasn't al alive at that time. But mm -hmm. if he had been alive, this is what would have happened. And so it's it's really, you know, it's it's the same as everything, right? With data, shit in, shit out. It's like, actually, yeah. you've got to be very, very clear about what you want. Otherwise, it is designed to fill in the gaps and not totally. necessarily necessarily in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I see it. I mean, I will say as an EOS implementer, I see it a lot when people are like, I don't know how to write a job description. I'm going to get chat GPT to write it for me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. but it, this is generic and bad. And they're like, but the computer made it. And I'm like, I don't know why you think that means it's good. <laughs> I love it. And I don't know about you. I mean, this job description thing does my head in a wee bit, right? Because yeah. I've got people who they do the whole accountability shot. They go, right, now we need to write a really, a, you know, really in-depth job description. It's like, well, I'm not sure about that. A job description could be one page. It's your five yeah. accountabilities that come from your accountability chart. It's your scorecard and your measurables that you're going to be held responsible for. Might have a bit of delegated authority in terms of delegated financial authority in terms of what you can and can't spend. That's kind of it. What, what more do you need? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so often the, the biggest mistake I find that people make when they're doing the job descriptions is they start to micromanage the how instead of just yeah. saying the what, right? Mm. Just when, if someone get if, if someone GWCs a position, you just need to tell them the outcome, right? Yeah. The outcome is you hit your sales quotas and you land new business and, you know, you um, update our marketing materials, right? That's what you're going to do. I'm not mm -hmm. going to sit here and write a job description that says, make five blog posts a week, make 20 phone calls, you know, make sure you're yeah. sitting in your desk and like, like, I'm not going to micromanage how you do your job because if you GWC it, if I tell you what the outcome is and I show yep. you what I expect out of you, the reason yep. I hired you is I expect you to have the skills, tools, resources, and ability to get there. Yeah. And I get a bit more blunt than that. I say, actually, I said to people, look, don't take this the wrong way, but actually, I don't give a shit how you do it. As long as you have GWC the role, you are following our company core values and living and breathing them, and you're focused on the outcomes, the how is entirely up to you, and I don't want to yes. hear about it. And that's what I see a lot of meetings that people run before they come onto EOS News Level mm -hmm. 10s. It's everybody wanting to tell you about what they're up to, the work, the work in progress. I don't give a shit about the work in progress, quite frankly. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's that, if you want to talk about that over the water cooler afterwards, great. But in this meeting, I, I just want to know, as long as you're a achieving your outcomes and you're living by our values we don't need to know how that's actually done <laughs> exactly yeah we need we need we need what comes out of it that's it that's what you know shit in yeah. one hand wish in the other see which comes fills up first <laughs> Excellent. I love it. okay um tell me a little bit about the kind of clients that you like to work with zach what's your kind of your typical client look like um so most of my clients are weirdos uh, most of my clients are non-traditional <laughs> leadership teams and non-traditional companies um they're they're companies they're yeah, i'll tell you um one of my clients is a uh, run by six women and transgender people. Um, and I was their fifth or sixth coach that they had hired. And I was the first one uh, that, that kept me around for a couple of years now. And they're like, you are the first one who did not condescend to us. 
right? Because, you know, so many coaches are these, uh, frankly, old white Republican men, at least here in America, and they would walk into a room full of women and trans people and just assume they didn't know what they were doing. Meanwhile, this is a company with like 20 to 30% net profitability breaking in millions of dollars a year. And I'm just like, how could anybody w- look at you and, and assess this as anything other than one of the most successful companies they've ever seen, other than just bias, right? Other than you looked at the people and didn't look at the numbers and understand these people are running a killer business and they are ripping the throats out of their enemies on their way, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, I work with a number of um, healthcare practices that uh, uh, specialize in the LGBTQIA plus um, and trans communities. Um, I work with uh, companies that are run by first generation immigrants. I mean, it's it's a lot of people who are overlooked by other people, frankly. And um, they, they find in me someone who will see them for who they are and create a safe uh, a home for them where, you know, they can feel good and, and get the work of EOS done. Yeah, I think that's actually really shame. It's all shame to hear that. I know that back in my early days, I'm kind of a little bit old in the tooth these days. But you know, back in my yeah. early days of my career, um, I was a young blonde female um, who really didn't get taken seriously for a long, long time. Yeah. And it was it was fascinating because the the stereotypes that kind of existed, the way you were even just treated as you walked into a room, and to see that that is still continuing on, but uh, you know, across all kinds of um, diversity, it's, it's just really sad. I mean, yeah, I don't know what to say to that. To be honest, it, it makes my yeah, heart. I mean, kind it, of it, it, Quiet it, it, we'd like to imagine that history is, you know, sort of like up and to the right, right? Like, oh, we're getting more progressive, we're getting more tolerant, we're getting more whatever. And yeah. not really. History is more of a series of mountains. It's more of a rises and falls and rises and falls. Um, mm-hmm. And the business community is is still a very discriminatory community on balance. You know, the, the it's still a very much a white men run um, kind of community. And there is a niche of us and there is a group of us who are running businesses in a different way and who are uh, uh, appealing to and working with those businesses who want to run their businesses in a different way. Um, But, uh, you know, you've got to look for them. Yep. Perfect. It is interesting, actually. I run a community over here in New Zealand, which is designed for kind of mid-sized, high-growth businesses. And I was saying to the guy who actually runs them all around New Zealand, I just run at the Auckland one, I was saying to him, you know, why do we have so many white, um, middle-aged men in this room? And he said, well, yeah. it's actually a reflection of the the businesses and and who runs those those types of businesses. And sadly, over here, it still is a bit like that. And it does my mm-hmm. head in because, I mean, um, you know, we, we all know that actually having diversity of any description adds to the value of a business business it adds to the value of the decision making it really creates a different environment um but we're just we're not not there yet are we we're kind of we're starting to get there which is great but we're just not there yet yep i mean and so yeah. I'm, I'm 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 here for them right i'm here to help them yeah. get there um and to mm-hmm. you know be the coach who sees them for who they are and not for what they look like brilliant i love it okay three top tips or tools what are the three things that you would say throughout your journey that you just kind of go this changed my life this changed my business whatever it might be um all right number one is going to be mushrooms um, so, uh, mushrooms. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah, magic mushrooms, uh, yeah. doing mushroom trips, um, under the guidance of a licensed therapist, uh, with the, in, with specific intents and outcomes has been an absolute game changer for me has helped me with my anxiety has helped me to see the world more clearly. Um, we were taught when we were kids that all drugs are bad and it turns out that's not true. Um, I feel much worse after I drink alcohol than I do after I do mushrooms. So that'd be my like, Number one tip for anybody who's looking to, to get ahead is um, get inside your own head first um, and, uh, and and go on a go on a I, I, it's important that I say this part, a safe, guided. healthy, guided trip, not just like taking a bunch of mushrooms and sitting in your basement and hoping that things work out. But, you know, having someone there whose job is to guide things and make sure that you get the outcome that you're looking for and to, you know, uh, keep the process um, safe and healthy. Uh, and there's, there's just to, to, to but in there's, there's plenty of practitioners that actually help with that now. I know that, again, Evan yes. Barley, one of the guys, was doing that, and and you can do it within a safe environment with a number of people. And yeah, as you said, you get more benefit from that than just just taking mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, they also totally. help. They also help with sleep, by the way. Um, you're seeing yeah. not not just the psychedelic mushrooms, but a lot of the mushrooms. They're finding that whole that whole family of mushrooms is actually great mm-hmm. for a whole range of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. there's a lot of science to be done and uh, a lot of benefit there, and I'm glad that that is starting to see the light of day and become a, a more a more common thing that people are are finding um, as a as a as a medicine as a tool. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd okay. say that's number one. Uh, number two, um, well, tips or tools for what? I mean, I mean, help me. I'm Business eight back. And, like, yeah, business and life. So if you think about this whole podcast, it's called Better Business, Better Life. Yeah. And I believe you have to work on both sides of that coin, if you like, even though I don't think there are eight sides of a coin. So yeah, any tips around business? So number life? two, I'm going to say is journaling, paper mm. journaling, a book and a pen or a pencil. And what I'll say is my handwriting is literally illegible. If you take one of my journals, you can't tell what the hell I said. 
I barely know what I said. But there is something about the physical act of writing things down that does amazing things to our brains, that helps us process, that helps us contextualize. Um, and even for me, who owns an IT company and who does everything on a computer and has this office is surrounded with smartphones and smart watches and smart wallets and smart uh, cameras and everything else. Mm-hmm. I take out a journal and a pen and sit down and write on a regular basis. And it, it really helps me sort of find my center and, and, and calmness. Um, and then, I, actually, I actually use my Remarkable um, yeah. because I do enjoy having But what I bought was I like this. I'm a bit of a, a kid, right? This is actually yeah. a, a Remarkable pen that looks like a real pencil. So I feel, like I'm a, I feel like I'm a school kid again, kind of you know, writing with my pencil. Yeah, cool. and <laughs> Remarkable is one of the only tools that crosses the barrier, right? Because you are. You're writing with a pen. Like it, it is a digital. <laughs> it's ultimately digital, but it's it, it has the same impact as writing by hand. You know, it has the yeah. same impact, right? So if you're, if you're using your Remarkable, Remarkable um, is, a, is a fantastic tool. Um, and then third... A critical tool, fiction reading. This is something okay. I found business leaders have really gotten away from. Or I don't know if they've gotten away from, but they just don't do it, which is people always talk about their favorite uh, business book. It's always, oh, what's the business book that you read had an impact? And, you know, business books are these dry uh, dictionary-like uh, uh, textbooks, right? Yep. And I think that there is so much to be learned from fiction about the things we actually deal with. Because in fiction, you see people in scenarios and you see how they react and you see how people respond to the things that happen to them in a way that's much closer to reality, right? You know, you read Traction, right? And I love Traction. I'm an EOS implementer, right? Traction's a phenomenal book. But Traction just says, assuming ideal conditions, these are the things you should do in your business, right? But it assumes ideal conditions. Fiction gives me a much better headspace on like, what about when you're trying to implement EOS in a company where dad's an alcoholic, mom won't leave, the kid is trying to, you know, bring it into the 21st century, you know, the customers don't want to buy the product anymore, right? Fiction is where we see real life and how things actually function and, 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 and how people actually function. And I think that when we as business leaders get too disconnected from real world experience of people, then we have a much harder time making the right choices in the business. Right. Yep, I think that's really cool. Um, it's really funny you said about, you know, traction. I actually got given, when EOS launched into New Zealand, they used my event center over here in New Zealand. That's how I came across yeah. it. And they gave me both the Get a Grip and the Traction book. And I tried reading the Traction book first and I kind of went, oh, it's actually a bit hard. And then I read the Get a Grip and, and what I loved about it was it's like the Patrick Lencioni stuff, right? It's very much a fable. You can mm-hmm, see the mm-hmm. characters, you can see how it engages. And then, of course, I was desperate to read the Traction book. But I think if I hadn't actually read Get a Grip first, I may never have actually got to traction because yeah, it was a little I, bit hard. You are not the first person I've heard that from. Yeah, yeah. And I do. I read a lot of fiction. And sometimes it's sometimes it's just escapism, too, to be fair. Sometimes it's just nice to actually move away from business, which is, you know, is all consuming for me um, to, to just have some escapism in trashy magazines or in books uh, around um, period, period dramas or romances. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, can that be like, can the third tool be like, have fun? Like, yeah. I see too many business owners and too many business leaders who just aren't having any fun. And I'm just like, y'all, you've got money, you've got power, you've got resources. Why do you look so sad all the time? Like, (laughs) let's enjoy this. You know, one life to live. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question for you. What would you tell a younger version of yourself if you could go back in time? Get a job. Just get a regular (laughs) ass job, work nine to five, get some promotions. For the love of God, don't start businesses. Don't (laughs) think you know better than Best Buy. Just get a job. Really? Oh, God, yeah. Because, I mean, look, I am, so uh, I think of, uh, not to be too much of a baby, but I think about the infinite number of possibilities of the future, right? There are an infinite number of possibilities from this moment outward, right? In this moment, the next thing that happens, a 747 could come crashing through my window and could kill me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, or a dog could be barking in the hallway, or somebody could send me a check for a million dollars. There's a million, there's an infinite number of future possibilities. Yep. My future possibilities from the time that I was a kid have led me to an extraordinary place where I have wealth and I have privilege and I do something I love and I have partners that I adore and I am a person that I really enjoy being. But if I were to look back at all the possible pathways, so many more of them led to bankruptcy and, you know, depression and everything going wrong. And, you know, how many moments were there where If the customer had said no instead of yes, then that critical deal wouldn't have happened and the company wouldn't have continued, right? So just because things turned out really well doesn't mean I look back and say that was a good decision. (laughs) I look back and say it would have been so much easier and so much kinder to myself and so much nicer to just get a job, have a career, get PTO. 
Like, I don't know, I don't know how many, I know very few business owners who take more PTO than their employees, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, most of them haven't taken vacations for years. Yeah, and that's not good. We're here to help them change that. I'm actually really glad that you didn't just take a job, though, Zach, because otherwise I wouldn't have been here on this podcast with you, and I wouldn't have learned about your sort of story, which has been really um, f- fascinating, so thank you. <laughs> I, okay, I mean, so, I'm glad, too, yeah. for how it worked out, but the advice yeah. to younger self would definitely be yeah. like, you are so much dumber than you think you are. You know so much less than you think you do. You haven't got the slightest clue everything that's going to go wrong and how much it's going to hurt and how many lessons you're going to have to learn. And, like, yeah. it might be worth it if you become me eventually, but also probably not and get a job. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, Zach. Um, I'm sure there'll be people out here kind of going, "I want to talk to Zach, whether it's to work with you or just to have a chat to you." How would they get hold of you? Uh, carrier pigeon. Um, so what you want to do is uh, <laughs> no. Um, so the easiest way, obviously, is uh, through my email address, um, Zach dot Kramer Z A C dot C R A M E R at eosworldwide dot com. Um, if yeah. you're like me and you're an introvert and you're afraid to talk to people, you can go to howtobusiness dot com, which is my business advice website. You can read articles that I've written there about how to do things in your business. Basically, if anybody, if I get the same question three times, I just write an article about it. So the next time I get that question, I can uh, send people a link. Um, yeah, those are probably the best ways to get old of me. Perfect. And for those of us in New Zealand, that's a Z rather than a Z, but that's all good. So Zach sure, Kramer, sure. <laughs> Zach Doc Kramer at eosworldwide.com or howtobusiness.com. That's the one. Hey, hey, Zach, look, thank you so much for spending your afternoon, Friday afternoon with me. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah. I'll look forward to seeing you next time over in the US. Super fun. Thanks for the time. Nice meeting you. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.